<laughs> Coming up on DTNS, where we think the epic Apple Google fight is headed, China leaps ahead in digital currency, and when we'll get our flying cars. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 14th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. Uh, heating up in uh, Southern California on the show's producer, Roger Chang. And we have with us host of AVXL, Patrick Norton, back on the show. How's it going, Mr. Norton? I, my temperature is lower than everyone else's, except maybe Lens, in terms of the outside temperature, and I'm just delighted. I have no okay, humidity. Okay, St. Louis uh, temperature yes. right now is what? 88 degrees, I think. All right, Glenn, Cleveland temperature is? 82. Ah, Cleveland wins. All right, yeah, there we go. Once uh, again, we were actually just Cleveland talking about <laughs> not only how hot it is in California, uh, but also uh, all kinds of other uh, interesting stuff, like how lewd Roger is. That was one of the things on Good Day Internet. <laughs> if you want to find out why we were mentioning that, become a member of patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Citing internal TikTok data and documents, the New York Times reports that in July, of TikTok's 49 million daily users in the U.S., 18 million were 14 years old or younger, 20 mm. million were older than 14, I know, shocker. And the ages of the rest just couldn't be classified because they couldn't be classified. Although so some good. users do self-report their ages, two ex-employees and one current employee at TikTok tell the Times that the company also estimates user ages using facial recognition algorithms on videos and profile pictures and through social connections to users whose ages are already known. The minimum age for using the app is 13, but a TikTok spokesperson Tell CNET it doesn't disclose user demographics. Google announced Friday it had not provided data based on requests from Hong Kong authorities since June, when a new national security law was imposed by mainland China. The company also says it will not directly respond to future requests. And the Washington Post reports Google will direct officials to pursue requests for data through the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty with the United States, which goes through the U.S. Justice Department. Mozilla has renewed a deal with Google estimated to be between 400 to 450 million dollars per year through 2023 to make Google search engine the default in Firefox in the US and other parts of the world. A Mozilla spokesperson confirmed the partnership had been renewed but declined to talk specifics or length or financials. On Tuesday, Mozilla laid off 250 employees and closed down its servo team, which was working on a new browser engine for Firefox using Rust, though the company says it will continue writing new browser components components in Rust just directly in Firefox, not as a separate project. In October 2019, security researcher Sagat Pakharel reported a bug to Instagram that when downloading a data archive from Instagram, the download included images and direct messages previously deleted by the user. Instagram had previously advised that it could take about 90 days to permanently delete data from its servers, but the researcher found information more than a year old when he downloaded the archive. Instagram reports the bug was fixed in August and that Pakharel was awarded a $6,000 bug bounty payout. Computer scientist Russell Kirsch, inventor of the Pixel, passed away mm. August 11th at his home in Portland, Oregon at 91 years old. Storied career. In 1957, Kirsch and a team of researchers developed a small 5 centimeter by 5 centimeter digital image scanner for the standards Eastern Automatic Computer, or SEAC, that went on to capture the first digital images ever. Kirsch and his team then developed algorithms for image processing and image pattern recognition used by NASA and helping to create things like cat scanning technology. Thank you, Mr. Kirsch. Here's your weekly vaccine check-in. There are six vaccines in phase three trials now, the last phase before approval. A Pfizer-BioNTech vac vaccine announced it. Its late-stage data is now targeted to arrive for October. Uh, that means they would get the data in October. It doesn't mean it would be ready for approval then. The U.S. and the U.K., however, have reached agreements to secure supplies of these shots because of that. The Moderna-Oxford University vaccine is still the first one to be expected uh, to reach approval sometime in mid Q3. All right, let's talk a little bit about digital licenses, Sarah. Digital licenses indeed. Cointelegraph reports that 1 million South Koreans have opted for a digital driver's license. That's about 3% of the driving population. So you know, there's a ways to go. It's a lot of people. The digital ID card launched in May in partnership with SKKT and LGU Plus Telecoms. The license appears in the Pass app. 
Users show the app's barcode or QR code for ID or proof of age. The back end of the license uses a blockchain for authentication. Australia's New South Wales is also testing a digital license that uses Ethereum's blockchain for verification. So it's all the rage. Yeah, there's a lot of digital licenses out there, um, but they use various ways of authentication. And blockchain is actually one of the more solid ones. I know blockchain gets thrown around <laughs> a buzz, as a buzzword a lot, but in this case, it's a good way to be able to verify and say, no, this, this app user is authenticated as this digital license holder. And seems like, I don't know, to me, Patrick, I don't know what you think, 3% adoption seems pretty good. That seems an excellent start. I, I was I was law I was actually very proud of, of Daily Tech News Show for not immediately leading blockchain invades driver's license. Um because <laughs> <laughs> it's just I, I, I was see a headline or two like that. You're right. Yeah, it was like all of the headlines were like that. Um I'm kind of fascinated by it. I'm kind of curious to see where it goes. Uh, you know, South Korea is very different from the United States, but uh, in terms of, of, you know, personal freedoms and accepting stuff like this, but I was kind of really fascinated by this and also kind of really half fascinated, half terrifying, terrified by the idea of where this could be in 30 years, like lose your phone, you can't be identified. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, this. well, I mean, that's actually one of the nice things about the blockchain aspect of this uh, is, is that it's, it, it, as long as you have a wallet attached to it, uh, you would be able to re-authenticate and get that that ID back. But you're right. right. The way blockchain also works sometimes is if you don't have multiple wallets, you lose that wallet, that that app, that then yeah. then you're screwed. So I think that's why the Pass app being part of this is is very important here. Yes. Google search will now show more travel details related to COVID-19. Uh, Travel-related searches will show the percentage of hotels in an area with rooms available, for instance, the percentage of flights currently available, and the Google Trips section will now display statistics about the number of COVID cases at a destination. Users will be able to sort hotels by properties with flexible cancellation policies as well. The updates are going to roll out over the next week. I'm not going anywhere, but there are people who have to travel right now mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons. And so this is an, yep. an excellent, uh, excellent tool. You're, you'll be traveling, Patrick? I, I have to do another. Uh, I've already flown once in the past uh, few weeks to, you know, fly to Reno and then bring most of our household back <laughs> to uh, <laughs> St. Louis. I have to do that a second time. And I'm, I, for one, I'm actually delighted uh, by this because it'll make it a lot easier to figure out some of the logistics involved. So, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. where I can stop safely without feeling really uptight should I find the stats for that place the day after I leave. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I'm like you, Tom, I'm, I'm not planning to fly anywhere soon or stay in a hotel. I mean, I'm lucky enough to not have to do that. But if I did, there'd be a host of questions that I didn't usually ask myself before. I mean, mm -hmm. there were always flights. It was just sort of like, what's the most convenient one? Now it's sort of like, can I get there? Is there going to be a place for me to stay? Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's th things have things have changed a lot in the uh, hospitality industry. Yeah, and the need to be able to flexibly cancel uh, more important than ever because, yeah, not mm -hmm. to be grim, but if you suddenly, you know, test positive and have to go into quarantine somewhere, you, mm -hmm. you want to be on the the last thing you want is to be worried about your cancellation fee at a hotel down the road. Absolutely. Well, uh, in other Google news, Google search results for sports TV broadcast sports will now, <laughs> just the one sports, will now uh, will show what channels carry a team's games as well as where to watch a live game on TV or streaming. The TV info will start showing up first for NBA and MLB games with other leagues and streaming options to be added over time. Also, when searching for what to watch, Google will now show carousels of recommendations for what's on TV now and what's on later that displays recommended TV shows and movies that are on live TV. Yeah, that carousel thing's kind of nifty. Uh, if you're like, just like, I don't know what to watch. Uh, show me some options and it'll show you, you know, what's what's currently on. You may be, be able to tune in right away or, or coming up soon. The sports stuff is disappointing to me. I think it's it's a good first step, and I know I, I hate to condemn first steps, uh, but right now it's telling you the channels that if you really follow a team, you probably already know. I already know that Sportsnet LA is where the Dodgers are. I already know Fox Sports Midwest is where the Cardinals are. I don't need Google to tell me that. What I do need it to tell me is, hey, what streaming services out there carry these channels? Uh, if I'm shopping around for services, is it AT&T TV now? Is it YouTube TV? Is it Fubo? Is it Sling? Uh, they don't have that info in here. And I think that's what makes this useful. So they say they want to get there and I'm, I'm cool waiting, but I, I don't know that this is terribly useful yet. 
I don't know. I can't tell you the, how many times uh, I, I, you know, watch people freaking out about a game that I'm not watching on Twitter or something, and I'm like, I want to watch it. And I Google, like, what channel are the Yankees <laughs> playing on right now? So anything that gives me a little bit more context, it can be helpful. It's not going to be helpful every day, but it's, you know, it's – you're right. I know where to watch the San Francisco Giants if they happen to be playing. But uh, but you know it's 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 more context for search results. Yeah, and I feel like this is the foundation they have to lay in order to build mm -hmm. the more useful functionality later. So that's fine. <laughs> China has been moving forward with an official state-run digital currency and announced its tests will now expand across Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and the Shenzhen, Hong Kong area. Shenzhen is in mainland China, but it's like right up next to Hong Kong. Uh, this increases the potential user base of the test from 41 million in a few restricted districts to 400 million potential people. Not all 400 million are going to use it, but it increases it quite a bit. Development of the digital yuan was accelerated after the announcement of Facebook's Libra project in June 2019. It's seen by China as a safeguard over the reliance on private solutions. I don't think people think about this as much, but the Chinese government is just as worried about the domination of its tech companies over certain arenas as the U.S. is over its. Alipay and WeChat Pay currently hold 96% of China's mobile payment market between them. And the government of China would like to have a little bit of that back. Uh, so they are creating the digital yuan. Uh, they're testing it and accelerating its movement out there far ahead of other countries in having a government-backed uh, digital currency. Ride-hailing service Didi Shuxing is among those partnering to accept the digital yuan during the tests. And while the currency is only for domestic use, some speculate that a long-term goal of China might be to make it useful for cross-border transactions to bypass the SWIFT global interbank network that could be useful for China in two ways. One is they could avoid some of those interchange fees that SWIFT charges, uh, but also if uh, there was pressure to get them to be kicked off the SWIFT network, which that's kind of a way out there possibility, but having an alternative to that might be important as well. I, I, yeah, I, I think this is fascinating. I think it's something that people should yeah. be aware of is that digital currencies are going to come and China is ahead of the rest of the world in it for, for lots of reasons. I guess, yeah, I, I, I that makes perfect sense. Uh, if you think of Alipay and WeChat having such a power over the Chinese population in terms of transactions, you know, how does an official state-run currency you know, we're expanding the test to 400 million, a lot, a lot of ways to go again, but, you know, huge, right. huge potential user base. You know, what does it look like in five years? Let's say this is really successful. I mean, is there some sort of, uh, you know, does, does, does WeChat somehow lose anything this way? I mean, potentially WeChat just incorporates the digital yuan right. and, and has a wallet inside and it's fine. Right. And everybody. Yeah. Hmm. Or. I don't know. I, I, I can't look at, at, you know, the government of China starting a currency and not think that this is just a really simple way for them to exert more influence over the populace over the long run. Uh, and oh, not certainly. necessarily. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I honest, mean, honestly, I'm not sure how much of an increase uh, it, it would be considering how much surveillance they have on transactions now, but it makes it easier, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, or, or it allows it, it gives them opportunities to sort of, you know, f you know, make it more and more difficult to use alternative currencies or to force this into every single thing that wants to use digital currency moving forward, you know, or just know everything that everyone buys at any time. Well, that they already do. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just, just another way to do it. Uh, Japan's SkyDrive has developed a two-seat electric vertical takeoff and landing, or EVTOL, VTOL, vehicle that is now in manned flight testing. The last manned flight was in March, with another expected this summer. SkyDrive hopes to offer commercial service to the public by 2028 in Tokyo or Osaka, and the company also plans to sell at least 100 privately owned vehicles by 2028. It can fit in the space of two average parking spots, and the commercial version could reach speeds of 60 kilometers per hour with a range of 20 to 30 kilometers at a time. Uber, Boeing, Airbus, Aeromobile, and others are also exploring VTOL vehicles. So, Patrick, are we getting our flying cars yet? I, you know, I, I'm looking at this, and it's it's. Uh, if you go to the 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 SkyDrive 2020 website, you know, it's essentially a big drone. And uh, I saw something, or at least in the sort of video that's showing on the website, and uh, 
uh, you know, this this could be the path. All I can think of is I saw a uh, like a Red Bullish kind of video where they had a remotely controlled human carrying drone, like doing a forward flip. And part of me is utterly delighted by this. And part of me is like, I just want to know the range and if there's a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the interesting thing. This is not autonomous. We hear a lot about autonomous VTOL. Uh, right. This is uh, the plan here from SkyDrive is to have a pilot and one passenger. Uh, and that's why it can only it can fit in in two spaces because it's not meant to carry. Usually these things are meant to carry four people, so there might be a pilot and three passengers, or if it's autonomous, four passengers. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we've heard from Uber in the U.S. or Saudi Arabia, for instance. Uh, so this feels like honestly, it feels like a more cautious approach to the flying car taxi kind of service. They say it'll be cheaper than a helicopter, uh, which is usually what these things are compared to. Uh, but you, I, you know, if they're only looking at selling 100, this is not the thing that's going to make everybody have one, at least not yet. I feel like every, I don't know, every six months or so, there's yeah. a story that comes up about this where we all kind of go, well, that's cool. Look mm -hmm. at that. Look at how it looks. All right. Let's get in the air. Let's, you know, <laughs> you got to be careful and you got to figure out some flight patterns and, you know, it's the highways of the sky. But uh, <laughs> I want it to happen, darn it. So Japan, uh, do me proud. <laughs> go Japan. Yeah. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right, in case you missed it, here's what's happened so far between Epic Games, Google, and Apple regarding Fortnite. Previously on the Google-Apple-Epic-Fortnite battle, uh, we touched on this yesterday because it was happening as we were doing the show. Epic offered an alternative to pay for in-app currency directly to Epic for $7.99, while leaving the Apple and Google options in the app at $9.99. So who would choose the Apple and Google options? Obviously, you're going to pay Epic the, for the cheaper in-game currency. This, of course, violated two policies in both stores because both stores require developers to use their own payment systems, and both stores prohibit server-side updates of this type that circumvent App Store review. That's the way they got it in there, is they did a server-side update so that it never went through the review process of either of the App Stores. As you might expect, Apple removed Fortnite from the App Store and issued a statement saying Epic knew this was a violation. The tone was, we're so disappointed in Epic. Why don't they just come to the table with us? Uh, Epic then posted a parody video of Apple's famous 1984 commercial in Fortnite and on YouTube. Epic then filed a civil antitrust suit claiming Apple is acting in an anti-competitive fashion in its app distribution and in-app payment markets. Epic says in its filing that it does not want money or special treatment, but is seeking injunctive relief to allow fair competition for all developers. That all happened before or during DTNS yesterday. Since we last met, Google, <laughs> as we expected, removed Fortnite from the Google Play Store, noting that, hey, at least on our platform, you could still install Fortnite on Android using other methods like sideloading or even other app stores like the Samsung App Store. In fact, Microsoft is pointing people to the Samsung App Store uh, if they want to get the Android version of it. Epic also filed a civil antitrust suit against Google it was largely similar to the one filed against Apple. It all it did include a note uh, that Google made OnePlus, the phone maker, break a deal to include a Fortnite launcher on OnePlus phones, except in India. Uh, LG also told Epic that its contract with Google prevented it from doing the same deal. So there's a little different of an anti-competitive spin in this lawsuit because they can po point to Google keeping their software off of phones. Two other side notes here. Uh, Ars Technica's Kyle Orland points out that Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo all take 30% of microtransactions on their game console stores as well. Epic lowered its in-app currency prices on these platforms to $7.99 within the payment system of those platforms. It has not said if it received a new deal to do this. It did not add an alternative way to purchase either. It just lowered the price. So they're picking a fight with Google and Apple over the 30%, they're not picking a fight with Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. Now, the other thing I've heard a lot of people ask is, is this because Tencent? Tencent is a Chinese company. They own about 40% of Epic, or at least have an investment worth about 40% in Epic. Uh, but Tim Sweeney himself holds more than 50% and has full control. Uh, just having an investment 
sometimes gives you influence, sometimes doesn't. Uh, in this case, it appears that it doesn't. Tim Sweeney is in full control of Epic. If you're still not convinced, ask yourself if Tim Sweeney might act like this if Tencent owned nothing of Epic, and you'll probably come to the answer I do, which is, yeah, this is very much in the uh, vein of how Tim Sweeney acts. Uh, if you want to find a connection to Tencent, you can invent one, but the situation does not necessitate it. All right, what's going to happen next? That's where we are now. Ben Lovejoy at 9to5Mac laid out a very good article describing all the different scenarios and how they could play out. A couple of the scenarios he mentioned have already played out, but there are four still yet to come. One, a settlement before or during the trial. Uh, this could be an agreement on reduced commissions, something else, some combination. We don't know, but maybe they settle. Uh, number two, Epic wins the lawsuit and there is injunctive relief. Now, we don't know what form that injunctive relief would take. The court would decide that they had found an anti-competitive behavior and what the remedy would be. It's not lined out in the lawsuit itself. Epic might lose the lawsuit, but then antitrust regulators who are already investigating Apple and Google kind of pick up the baton with an improved case based on what they learn out of the Epic lawsuit, or maybe this spurs new legislation. The fourth of the scenarios is that Epic loses this fight and nothing changes. And Epic, you know, maybe loses a little money, but otherwise uh, comes out largely unscathed. So mostly Epic has nothing to lose, right? Well, um, Epic pulled Fortnite from uh, Google Play in the past. Um, as you mentioned on the show, I think it was on the show, or at least in the post-show, Tom, yesterday. Um, you know, that lasted like a year, and finally the company was like, all right, okay, give, give it back to the folks. Um, has come back to the table with guns blazing, obviously. Yesterday was uh, an interesting day for Epic. A a an Epic news day, you might say. Uh, and it rolled out, you know, <laughs> through the night. And, you know, I have expected a lot of other companies to be sued by the time I woke up this morning. But, you know, clearly well-orchestrated plan of attack. Uh, Epic knew that Apple would say, whoa, can't do this. Pull the app. Then there are these videos ready to go. There's tweets. There's there's press. It's It's a whole thing. Um, the Google stuff unfolded a little bit later in the day, but Epic was ready for that as well, saying, hey, guess what you did? Remember what you did to us with OnePlus uh, or what you did to OnePlus with us? There's that, too, and everyone's going to know about it now. So I don't know. I mean, I think that this I, – I don't think it gets settled before court. I think Apple is, is ready for it. Uh, Google as well. They've got lots of time and money to lose. Um, Epic could lose and nothing could change, but I think that the company is trying to be, you know, the bastion of change, and I, you know, it, they're they're getting a lot of attention by doing so. Patrick, what do you think? I'm, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm I'm still kind of completely fascinated by this because, uh, you know, this this just this was completely and totally done to pick a fight, obviously. You know, the uh, the uh, the the filings were ready to go. The filings were ready to go against Apple and Google. Um, Sarah, like you pointed out, uh, you know, they they didn't go after the console makers, which is kind of peculiar to me, um, except that maybe they feel that there's enough competition there that it's it's, you know, not worth the fight right now. Or if they can take out Apple and Google on this. They don't, you know, the the rest of the the manufacturers will kind of follow along. It's a weird fight to pick because I also think that Apple could decide to make a very expensive example of Epic. Um, you know, uh, that was that was one of the things that the nine to five Mac article, um, the uh, uh, the Ben Lovejoy write up. Like he was like, well, you know, they could also, you know, decide to basically cut off you know they could settle they could lose the battle they could settle this and apple could refuse to let them back into uh the uh the app store and part of me thinks apple might just be vindictive enough to do that you know fight this for as long as they have to fight it and then kill them off i mean it's it's kind of crazy because a lot of people don't realize the kind of money you're talking about here uh and if the numbers are correct and a lot of these numbers you know based on the the internet's finest financial minds they're talking about uh, Fortnite being worth like two and three quarter million dollars a day in in app sales on uh, on uh, iOS, which is a billion dollars a year, which is an astronomical amount of money. Uh, 
Uh, and that means Apple's cuts 30, 300 something million dollars a year, which is, you know, as dad used to say, real money. Um, <laughs> you know, and, but, but also uh, to, to be fair, Epic also makes a lot more money off the other platforms. So it's, it's a good gamble for them to say, all right, we'll take that hit for a while because right. we're still going to be making most of our, oh, money. I don't, I don't, I don't, I think, I think, I think Epic is, I, I think this is Friday night. Epic's had a long week down in the coal mines and they've just walked into the bar, had two shots and they're going to pick a fight with everyone. This is like. You know, because yeah, but they hey, also came in prepared. You know, with a blackjack and a, and some brass knuckles, right? This yeah. wasn't a last minute decision. <laughs> no, 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 no. This was this was well planned. I'm, yeah. I'm not trying to suggest that this is like you know they woke up yesterday and went, you know, I think I'm going to take on one of the largest concentrations of capital and legal expertise on the planet. In fact, let's take the two largest concentrations of capital and legal expertise on the planet. Right now. No, no, I, I agree. It was this was this is this is obviously they're like, you know what? What's the worst case scenario? We lose our revenue off of, you know, uh, all of Apple's platforms. The best case scenario is that they have a significant reduction in their cost of participating on that platform. I'm just fascinated because in a straight reading, there's no way they can win this case, which means they're either just trying to stir it up and look for a sympathetic uh, jury uh, or a sympathetic uh, judge. Or they have something in there that I can't quite figure out. And obviously, I am not a lawyer and will never be mistaken for one. But, you know, they're, they're obviously like, you know what, let's just this is this is this is pot stirring. Uh, yeah. Well, for high stakes. That's why I think scenario three is probably the most likely outcome, which is Epic loses the lawsuit. But antitrust regulators who are slobbering to come for Apple and Google will pick up the baton. And that is probably what Epic is thinking is like, yeah, we'll probably lose the case. Uh, if we win, great. But if we don't, we, we have now helped the momentum along. We've pushed this uh, forward even faster than it was already going. And, and they're, they're blazing a trail for the attorneys general and, and, and such to, to come after yeah. uh, and give, give them more ammo to come, come after Apple and Google with. Because you know, if, if you lose a lawsuit, you can now look at that lawsuit and figure out why it was lost and adjust your strategy accordingly. Yeah, I'm, I mean, and it's it's, it's funny because Robert and I have talked a bunch on AV Excel about the incredibly there's there's no HBO Max app on on Roku yet, and there's we've been watching different apps taking forever to show up on different platforms, and all of that it mostly comes down to negotiating what cut somebody mm -hmm. gets of the revenue. And this could have some very interesting positive and very interesting negative effects on that and the bottom line of the companies that that make these, that have created these markets. I would say the outside possibility too is that Apple, uh, Google, and Epic come to a settlement during the trial uh, because maybe the trial starts going a little longer uh, and, and, and they come to an agreement. The way that Amazon and Apple, not because of a court case, but Amazon and Apple eventually came to an agreement over premium video to let Amazon take in-app payments so that Apple could have its stuff back on the Amazon store because it just dragged on long enough. But this is going to drag on. This is going to drag on for a long time. Yes, it is. Well, something that doesn't drag on is our Discord conversation. In fact, it's very <laughs> snappy, and you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. What do we have in the mailbag? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Gregory wrote in and said, I think if the browser vendors wanted to encourage better domain protections, they could have, just have, a dedicated safe harbor collection of domain names that they could use to indicate in the URL that the domain is validated and safe. We talked yesterday about the idea of shortening those long URL strings to a domain to help people be able to better identify when a website was not what it said it was going to be. Uh, Gregory says, for example, Chrome shows a lock when a site has a valid HTTPS certificate, which any Joe Schmo can get. So why not do the same thing as an approved list, like formerly known as a whitelist, with credibility criteria that the site would have to meet, maybe using some additional icon or color coding or both. They could even do something specific to the industry so they could differentiate bank domains, healthcare providers, governments, places where identity protection, very critical. If a domain is not on the approved list, then the URL could be yellow or red, like a known scam site or some other indicator if people were colorblind, et cetera. And then the safe icon would be missing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a cool idea. Uh, the devil's in the details about which sites get put on the list and which don't. I think that's mm -hmm. why 
Google starts to back off, especially with all this antitrust around, uh, picking and winners, picking winners and losers uh, starts to be uh, a, a difficult thing. But I like your, like, if it's a known scam site, if you can point to an exterior list and say, no, it's not us picking, it's on there. But, you know, maybe you could do that part of it. Uh, it's a good idea, though, Gregory. Thanks for sending that. Absolutely. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Kevin Irwinster and Dan Kolbeck. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been drawing today's episode art prov style. Len, what have you drawn for us? <laughs> you know, uh, I gotta be, I gotta tell you, I, I don't know very much about Fortnite. However, I find this whole thing fascinating. Uh, anytime uh, two huge behemoths go at it, you gotta love it, sort of like a kaiju fight. And uh, this is my take on it. You know, I didn't really know what to draw exactly, but I did some research and I saw that there's a character in Fortnite named Peely who came out of skin, <laughs> which was a banana. And I thought that was very funny, a sure. banana taking on an apple. Sure. Uh, so uh, so that's what this is. This is called uh, uh, App Store Battle Royale. Uh, and uh, it's, it de depicts Peely taking on Apple. It's not quite apples and oranges, but it's close. Uh, <laughs> if you want to check it out, uh, you can go to uh, my Patreon site, patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. I like that the Google Play triangles are like shards coming yes. off of the, uh, <laughs> They're all the over. It's, yeah. it's a huge mess. It's a battle royale. Tom. Totally, you, totally. Great. I uh, love it, Len. Also, thanks to Patrick Norton for being with us. Patrick, you're a busy man. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Oh, best place to keep up with it is avxl.com, the podcast on home theater and audio host with Mr. Robert Heron. And I have a new podcast launching next week that I don't mm -hmm. want to talk about now because if I do, things will go wrong and the internet will fail me. Not the well, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If you say it, it'll come true or not. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Uh, so yeah, and keep an eye out for that. Drove themselves to Chicago, and the and the coach checked out for the rest of the season. So I ain't saying anything. Don't give me that bill that they will come business, Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> For now, <laughs> avxl.com, and watch uh, watch all the social media signals uh, for the thing that Patrick is alluding to. Uh, hey, folks, uh, we've been talking about it all week, uh, so I hope you're you're dressed head to toe in DTNS gear. But if you're not, uh, we've got mugs, we've got mouse pads, we got stickers. Uh, we got hats, we got masks. Uh, they all say DTNS on them, and they're all pretty cool. And uh, you should go check them out. Maybe if you buy one, uh, you'll enjoy it, and it'll help the show. Go check it out, dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. If you got a comment on something we talked about today or yesterday or all week or just have something on your mind, you can email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you can watch us live, we'd love to have you Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Allison Sheridan telling us about her adventure creating a cool open source ebook. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>